This is Brian Wildenthal. This online fall symposium presented by the Shakespeare Oxford Fellowship, or SOF as we call it, is dedicated to the memory of our former president, Tom Renier. All of us in Tom's wide circle of friends and loved ones, inside and outside the SOF, were shocked and saddened at his untimely death last April. Tom was my good friend and colleague. We spent several years together on the SOF Board of Trustees. Tom was a lawyer, something he and I shared in common. I spent most of my career teaching. Tom was also a teacher, and he excelled at it. Tom enjoyed being an adjunct professor, teaching legal subjects and the connections between Shakespeare and the law. Tom was also a brilliant trial lawyer. He built a successful career arguing legal appeals. You can tell right away, watching any of his recorded lectures, what a gift he had for communicating with a jury. His skill in translating complicated facts and difficult rules and concepts into plain English in a down-to-earth way that anyone could relate to. This symposium, Honoring Tom, continues our year-long celebration of the centennial of J. Thomas Looney's book, Shakespeare Identified, which first presented in modern times the theory, and more importantly, the evidence that the likely true author of the Shakespeare plays and poems was Edward de Vere, the Earl of Oxford. If there is one central theme of Tom Renier's life work, the same theme driving Looney's book and the central focus of this symposium and the entire centennial, it is evidence. The relative lack of evidence supporting the traditional claimed author from Stratford, the ample evidence undermining that claim, raising numerous doubts and questions, and the remarkably vast array of circumstantial evidence supporting the Oxfordian hypothesis. The video you're about to see was assembled by Jennifer Newton, our website design and technology editor. I hope you enjoy it and pay heed to the message of that final slide that Tom displays. Demand evidence and think critically. Well, I became an Oxfordian when started when I read some articles that were in the Atlantic in 1991 about the authorship question. Uh, one article that argued that Oxford was the actual author and another that argued that the Stratford man was the real author. And that got me interested in it. I read Mark Twain's book, Is Shakespeare Dead? that said that the real author of Shakespeare's works had to be somebody who was trained in the law. And that supported the idea that it was uh, a nobleman and not the man from Stratford. And so I, I studied that some more when I was in law school and uh, wrote a paper on that. And the rest is history. <laughs> You might want to try this experiment. Go to a major university library and find the, find the stacks where they keep the Shakespeare books. And you'll probably find several rows of bookcases with works about Shakespeare, many of them interpreting his works, but many of them also analyzing Shakespeare's knowledge in particular technical areas. And I have some experience with this because I have taught a course on Shakespeare and the law at the University of Miami School of Law, and we would spend an entire semester going through six or seven Shakespeare plays and several sonnets and look for legal imagery, legal plot twists, legal themes that underlie the works. And there are about 50 books written about Shakespeare's knowledge of the law, most of them by lawyers. And there are no books written on Christopher Marlowe's knowledge of the law or Ben Jonson's knowledge of the law or any other Elizabethan playwright. Shakespeare is unique in that respect.
In most trials, you will have both direct and circumstantial evidence. Most cases may be proved entirely with circumstantial evidence. If you've got enough of it, if it fits together properly, you can make the entire case just with circumstantial evidence. And this, and I think this is probably the most important point, direct evidence is not necessarily better or more persuasive evidence than circumstantial evidence. And let me give you an example. Let's say you've got a paternity case. Okay, uh, here's one from the tabloids. <laughs> Justin Bieber is the father of my baby. Okay, so let's, let's say you've got a paternity case here, and you've got, you've got uh, two kinds of evidence here. You've got uh, direct and circumstantial evidence. The direct evidence is the mother's testimony. And the mother testifies that um, she had intercourse with Justin Bieber uh, around the time that the child would have been conceived. She didn't have intercourse with anybody else around that time, and she wasn't artificially inseminated or anything like that. And this is direct evidence. She's there. She would know, and if what she says is true, then he's the father. But it's always a big if, as I said, on direct evidence. Uh, then you've got another kind of evidence, and that's DNA evidence. And now DNA evidence is circumstantial evidence, because the DNA test doesn't just come out with saying, Justin Bieber is the father. <laughs> it, it comes out with a profile of Justin Bieber's DNA and a profile of the child's DNA, and the scientist will look at that and they'll make calculations and they'll figure out what are the odds that Justin Bieber is the father based on these two DNA profiles. And uh, the odds might be, be very high in favor of his being the father. It might be a million to one that he's not the father, but you still have to make an inference from that. It's never gonna be 100% that he's the father. But let's say in this case that the mother's testimony conflicts with the DNA test. Well, I think most of us will probably take the DNA test. Why? Because the mother has a motive to lie. The DNA test does not have a motive to lie. So you can't always trust uh, direct evidence more than circumstantial evidence. You have to keep that in mind. Of course, in Thomas Loney's great book, Shakespeare Identified, he talks about circumstantial evidence and coincidence. And Loney says, Circumstantial evidence is, in practice, the most reliable proof we have. The predominating element in what we call circumstantial evidence is that of coincidences. And he says a few coincidences we may treat as simply interesting, a number of coincidences we regard as remarkable, a vast accumulation of extraordinary coincidences we accept as conclusive proof. And I think that that is an extremely astute definition of circumstantial evidence. Loney goes on to say, it is not on any point separately, but upon the manner in which all fit in with one another and form a coherent whole that the case rests. Works unconnected to the author's life. So now what they're saying, and James Shapiro of my alma mater, Columbia, uh, whom I'm very ashamed of, um, <laughs> um, is going around saying, no, don't look for anything of his life in the works. There's, there's nothing to do with his life in the works. And, and the reason he's saying that is because the Stratfordians have realized that what the Oxfordians have is Oxford's life is in the works. You know, so the Stratfordians are trying to find the Stratford man's life in the works, and it's really hard, it's really a stretch. Uh, there was a biography of the Stratford man uh, written about 10 years ago by Stephen Greenblatt of Harvard, uh, and he tries to tie the Stratford man's life to the works of Shakespeare. It's really tough. His book starts out with the phrase, let us imagine. <laughs> and there's a lot of imagination in it. I think it actually should have been on the fiction list. Um, but anyway. This is a Matt Cubis from uh, the book Shakespeare Beyond Death, this one I mentioned, the one that the Stratfordians wrote. Um, and he says, what is the problem with reading biographically? And he tells us what the problem is. He said, the critical assumption that there is an inherent connection between the author and the content of his works. So let's not go around assuming that 
the author's life has something to do with this work. There's no inherent connection. Anybody here a writer of any kind? OK, well, I think a lot of writers would be surprised to hear that there's no connection between their life and their works. By the way, I'd like to mention something else about this book, Shakespeare Beyond Doubt, the one that Stratfordians wrote to uh, make the argument that there is no uh, doubt about Shakespeare. Prince Philip read this book and became a doubter. <laughs> he read their book. I wish I, wish I could say he read our book and became a doubter, but he read their book and became a doubter. So it shows how effective this is. Um, let's move on here. Now, I think this is a better explanation of a connection between life. This is a, a, the life and the works. This is from Professor Michael Delahoyd, who is an Oxfordian, and he's a professor at Washington State University. He says, if you get Shakespeare wrong, you get literature wrong, and probably you get the very phenomenon of creativity wrong. And I think that that is really the point. Because the argument between the Stratfordians and the Oxfordians now is about how these works are created. To the Stratfordians, it's just, it was all inspiration. There was almost no sweat involved, no personal involvement. It just all came into his head and he wrote it down. You read Oxford's life, you can see that in these plays, he is dealing with his fears, his disappointments, his triumphs, even expiating his sins. You can see the author's life in the plays. And we think that this is the way most art is created. It comes from the author's soul. And Oxford was pouring his heart and soul into these plays. It was not something that was written dispassionately. Okay, the Shakespeare Oxford Fellowship is an organization that is interested in the Shakespeare authorship question. That is, the question of who actually wrote Shakespeare's plays, because a lot of people believe it was not the man from Stratford. And in the Shakespeare Oxford Fellowship, we believe that most of the evidence points towards Edward de Vere, who was the 17th Earl of Oxford, and that he was the actual author of the plays. What, what we'd like to do is we'd like to make more people aware of the evidence for Oxford as the real Shakespeare. And we think that the more people become aware of that evidence, the more they'll be convinced that he was the real Shakespeare. How can people get involved with your you know, organization? Well, there are lots of ways. Probably the, the way to start is to go to our website, which is shakespeareoxfordfellowship.org. And uh, we've got all kinds of information there. You can also sign up to be on our email list and uh, get regular news bulletins from us about the authorship question. And then if you want to go further, you can become a member. Uh, you can get our newsletter, a subscription to our newsletter. You can come to conferences and things like that. But e even, if you don't, even if you aren't able to become a member or to go to conferences or things like that, you can always follow the, the news on our website. I'd just like to tell people that uh, you know, it's a fascinating subject. As Derek Jacobi said, it's the best whodunit in the world. And, uh, a really interesting subject and I uh, hope they'll open their minds up to it.